Okay, so hi everyone and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you to this session. Uh, my name is Maria de Brasdefer and I work as a policy and research officer for the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. So today, and also in view of this year's IGF theme, The Internet We Want, uh, what we would really like to do is to take this opportunity not just to present uh, sh a series of short cases to you, but also to exchange and explore with you the topic of digital empowerment and to approach it from a slightly different perspective. So of course we know that the fact that you're here sitting in this room, just as well as all the other many people who are attending the IGF this year, uh, it means that you're already aware of the great value that lies in using the internet as a tool to advance access to information, um, but also, and more importantly, on the great value that meaningful access has on our societies as a whole. We also know that a society where citizens can make better informed decisions will automatically translate into a more democratic society where people will exercise their citizenship in a more participatory way. Uh, but ultimately, they'll also be able to uphold their rights both inside and outside digital spaces. But of course, saying that it's the easy part. Uh, so we are aware of that. And in that case, the real question remains, uh, how can we do that? And also, what are the best approaches for this? So having this in mind, uh, today we would really like to present you with a short series of four five-minute case studies that will look at the themes that lie at the intersection between digital empowerment, the documentation of local knowledge, uh, but also the mobilization of the global library infrastructure to help people access the internet and make the most of it. So for this, we have four speakers with us today. Um, I think my slides are not showing. Uh, yeah, there it is. So we have Eric Huerta uh, Velasquez from Rizomatica in a collaboration with SITSAG and APC. We also have Woro Titi Haryanti from the National Library of Indonesia. We have also Trish Hepworth from the Australian Library and Information Association, who will be joining us online. And we also have Yasuyo Inoue from the Tokyo University in Japan. Uh, but before we dive into these uh, case studies, what we would like to do is also, we would really like to hear from you because as we're not many today, it would be good to, to exchange more. So we would like to do a quick reflection exercise with you first. So for this, and in case you're not familiar with it, uh, you can either scan the QR code with your phone or you can enter the website www.menti.com and then you will see a space where you can enter the code 18381615. I will give you a couple seconds. So now what you should see on your phones is the following question. So we have the question of, have you thought about how can libraries contribute to digital empowerment? If you've thought about it before, uh, you can share how, in what ways, and in case you haven't, you can also share, no, it never crossed my mind, or simply no. Okay, so, so far we only have one yes. These uh, responses are anonymous, but of course you will also be able to, to comment on them at the end of the session if you'd like. Okay, so we have a second response. Yes, media literacy awareness coding lessons, etc. Yes, that's, that's very accurate. We have another, just a yes. Okay, 
more yeses. So that's good. We don't have any no's so far. Uh, digitalized knowledge, which is not yet digital. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting one too. Okay, so I think we don't have any other replies, but this is good news because it means that we're all of us were more or less on the same page about it. It means that we've thought about it before, uh, but maybe we don't know exactly how. And this is also why we're here gathered today to discuss a little bit about that and, and give you some insights on that. So for this, uh, it is time now for our first presentation. So our first presenter will be Mr. Eric Huerta. So Eric works at Rizomatica in collaboration with CITSAC and APC. And he's also an expert of the International Telecommunication Union for connectivity issues related to remote and indigenous people, and has served as a co-rapporteur on development of information technology and communication in remote areas and groups with unattended needs. Eric, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and I'm sorry for <laughs> being late. Uh, I got lost within the rooms. Like it's, it's very, si it looks very similar, and I went to the different ones. Well, um, um, I mainly um, our work in Rizomatica is mainly with indigenous uh, communities, and uh, so that's uh, that's um, like um, uh, make me think about what we could share in this uh, in this session it was more about well the role of libraries but also also the question what is a library for uh, for everyone and and maybe um, if it does the same I think one of the things that um, like a, it's a barrier for uh, the use of the internet some uh, for some people is that it's non meaningful content within the in the, in the internet no there is a uh, th that's um, explained as one of the barriers the barriers of uh, uh, of in internet adoption and some of them is is about the content no? sometimes some communities even say well um, i it's when they have to take a decision on whether which technology have to use sometimes they some communities refuse to um, to get into the internet because of the kind of content that people will find there that sometimes have no relations with uh, to the reality or sometimes uh, it's uh, exposed to to certain content that they they don't want to be exposed to that uh, specific uh, uh, content so well that uh, made me think about can, can we put the first one well that's the sort of of communities we we work with, so uh, we help mainly. Uh, um, we work together with indigenous communities that wants to to run their own media, such as uh, uh, community radios, such as um, um, uh, in community mobile uh, networks. No, they they are owner of their own mobile networks, and also we have uh, this. Um, applied research program in which communities um, um, define which uh, sort of re local research that they want to do to for a specific task and there's some examples no so there you have the uh, the opening of a, a communication center in uh, in a rural area in Quetzalan that's some of the sort of the communities that have their own mobile network. And this is a community in the south of Mexico that works a lot with traditional uh, medicine and, and that's uh, the project. The next, please. So my, my first question is, uh, so what is a library? No? So when, when we think about a library, so we mainly think in the, uh, in the picture that is in our left. No? But when you talk with some communities and uh, what is a library for them, it's, it's, it's this, no? it's the territory. Because most of the, uh, the territory is uh, it's, it's talking, 
is saying, is where they learn, is where they teach each other, is where they, uh, is where um, they, they got the local knowledge and this meaningful knowledge to manage and understand the territory. And so, uh, how do we put together these different con uh, concepts of library? Uh, or this reservoir of knowledge that it's in the in the nature on the territory of the communities and uh, the concept of, of library that we find in, in uh, uh, as in books no? and, and the storage of of knowledge in, in books no? and what are the chances that the internet give us to to do so so the next the next one um, so I, I think that uh, ICTs can bring together these two concepts of, of library, mainly uh, because most of the knowledge, for instance, in the, uh, in the um, communities, it's, uh, it's on oral knowledge, no? and it's more related to knowledge that is fully in practice. No, it's not uh, actually, uh, so for many of the languages there are, are oral, are starting to be written, but not, not uh, but mainly are, uh, are languages that are not, not written. And um, so uh, that is the main difficulty of bringing local knowledge into the libraries because the libraries are mainly related to books. But when we uh, um, bring ICTs into a library, even if it doesn't have a connectivity, but has a local storage and that, then you can bring inside songs, then you can bring inside uh, music, then you can bring videos, then you can bring all those uh, stories that form part of the local knowledge of the communities. And uh, so this sort of um, work is, uh, is, more, is mainly what many communities are interested in. So, for instance, in this picture that uh, it's in the in, in my right, um, they uh, are they are, are sharing this uh, person are sharing um, the recovery well the experience on the recovery of some of the local uh, uh, language and the local variety of their languages and bringing out some words and bringing out some stories and some research they they did on on, on that. And uh, then uh, this space, they are um, having a workshop on how to um, put this knowledge together in a handbook, on a manual, and, and so on, no? so that they could share it better with other people. So that's uh, uh, that's the idea. The other the other side, um, the other photograph uh, is from a community that was one of the first in having these mobile uh, self mobile networks. And also they have a university, uh, they, and they have a, a library from the university as well. But one of the things that they were more interested in, in complementing this uh, library, was uh, the intranet. They, they, they said, well, we got this library, we got the books here, but we need a lot of, uh, um, we need to document a lot of the findings that we are having from our knowledge. We also need to bring all the videos, the music that we need uh, for, and that's a complementary part of the library of the of the uh, of the local university of the indigenous local university. Um, and then the, the next one, please. And then in in this one, uh, I wanted to to share. In the recent years, we have been. Um, we, we mainly work with, uh, well, we, from long time ago, with community radios. But uh, this also we open uh, uh, this local research program from that uh, brings us some other different um, um, experiences through. So um, I'm going to talk about these two, uh, two experiences, two, two chances that we have. Um, to bring on document uh, specific knowledge, we we got with uh, with UNESCO um, um, uh, some consultations on to develop the um, um, policy for indigenous community radios in in, uh, in Mexico, and from there the so some needs came, some specific needs came. 
and uh, some of them were specifically related with local archives of the radios. So a lot of the uh, so the radios and this one in the in the left is a radio that was the first uh, community radio. Um, of Mexico, so it's about 60 years old, this community radio. And they have a splendid ar archive of many of the um, voices, knowledge, festivals, and so on. And was about to be get lost because that's a, an area that is very humid and so on. So uh, when expressing the need of, uh, of um, being in this local archive, the the phonotech, uh, the phonotech um, take uh, uh, take interest in that and help them to to um, uh, restore the the um, uh, the tapes and also they are now keeping them. They have a copy and they they are now keeping in the in the phonotech now. So it has access for well they they ensure that this this uh, archive would be. Uh, last forever, and then also uh, some communities they decide together that some community radios decided to have a, um, a one-hour program every week, and that's in the national radios, and so that's that has become also an important reservoir for knowledge uh, in the communities. For instance, it has, they, they determine which are the subjects they want to talk about, um, but they, each, each of these programs is really rich in knowledge because some, for instance, some of them talks about the textiles and they bring together some, a lot of information that is not in the books, is not in there because it comes from, ex, uh, from the, the, per, the person in the community. <laughs> and well, these other two, yes, uh, very quickly. Um, one is a, a community that started the research because they, they were Afro-descendant and they wanted to, to be what the, the origin of them was. And the last one is an indigenous, is an, another indigenous community that they run their um, itinerant uh, museum. And these pictures that you see there, then you touch these pictures and then they play the music or they play uh, the stories of that. And that, well, that was what I, what I wanted to, to show you. Uh, can you go for the last one? And uh, we want, thank you very much. And uh, we wanted to, to show, we want to share on these possibilities of um, using the ICTs to, to incorporate local knowledge in, in libraries, and those are uh, where you can find more information about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, uh, yeah, for sharing all these nice cases with us, uh, but also to emphasize on the importance of not just promoting local knowledge and building up local knowledge, but also on the importance of storing it and uh, how hard it is sometimes for certain communities to access not only their own knowledge, but also to store it sometimes. So, and also the role that libraries that play in it. So thank you so much for, for sharing it. Um, so please keep in mind that there will be a space for asking questions to the speakers, uh, but now we're going to move on uh, towards our next presentation. So our next presenter will be uh, Woro Titi Haryanti. Uh, so Woro, as I mentioned, uh, she is a senior librarian from the National Library of Indonesia, and she has also been working in capacity development for librarians and also library technicians across Indonesia and for more than 30 years. So go ahead, Woro. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> I agree with Eric said that there's a, 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 what is library is the reservoir of knowledge. And that's, we are going to, I'm going to tell you that what the National Library rules to refill the, the knowledge uh, discovery to the community. Yes, uh, yeah, can go to the second. Next, please, yeah. Okay, next, please, yeah. This is the presidential directive, five steps to be taken to accelerate the national digital transformation. This is not the area of the National Library, but this is related, close related to the National Library. It is the, the function of the Ministry of Edu uh, Communication and Information. 
it, is, it should be taken into immediate action to expand the internet access and develop digital infrastructure and provide internet services for all. I mean, there is a targeted for the, the people, the, the population to get the access to the internet. And this is important for us for, as a library. So as, as long as they get the access, then the knowledge can be transferred there. And then the second, uh, it's targeted about uh, one, uh, 196 million, 7,014 and 70, that is the targeted uh, to be, uh, get the access of the internet. And then we have to the prepare transformation digital roadmap for the government strategic sector, public services, social ads, and et cetera. And then the third is to take immediate action to integrate national data center. This is also a library can contribute the data that is to be restored in the uh, national data center. And then into taking it down into the need of the digital talents. This is also important for us because through this digital talent that there will be training yeah at what there will be training for peoples to be able to access the internet that is uh, well it targeted quite a lot from the ministry of uh, communications and this uh, facilities to this data center that national data center it means to facilitate the, uh, what's it, uh, to, to facilitate all the governments to restore their, uh, to store their data and then can be accessible for the community. And this also the digital talent include digital literacy. Their target is all over Indonesia. They collaborate with 12 ministries, private sectors and communities. Digital skills, digital uh, digital skills, digital culture, digital ethic, and digital safety. This will be covered in the curriculum. Digital society, digital economy, and digital government. And then they divide. They they, they put it into two categories for the training. That is the training for the uh, skills for prof, uh, proficient class, and then also the empowering the cyber creativity creativities that is the inclusion class. And this, next please. And this also directed from the president for the libraries to improve and to expand access to the digital libraries in order to accelerate the human resource development who will master science and technology, improve creativities and innovations to the create job Opportunities reduce unemployment rate, increase income per capita, as well as increase foreign exchange to create prosperity for all. That is the directive to the library. Next, uh, this is the uh, function of the role and the function of the national libraries. Yes, as the li uh, library, as the networking center, and also the preservation center. This library networking, it means that we will collaborate with other uh, institutions and then make a network to create more uh, local knowledge, local uh, to create knowledge that can be shared together. And then preservation center, as this also we have to localize uh, their, their local informations, local content that should be preserve, uh, preserved and also can be accessed. And then this research center, this post, uh, depository center and reference library center, and of course this library development center, but. Uh, in here, this is the role of National Library. And we have also obligation, next thing. Okay. We have the, uh, the obligation to develop library national system in supporting national education system and guarantee the sustainability of libraries to community as a learning centers. That's again, that we have to provide them with the access and also the, the content. And guarantee the availability of the library services throughout the nations and guarantee availability of collections through translation, liter transliteration, transcription, and transmedia. And also we promote reading habits and also develop library collection and develop national library itself. We also have to be developed and appreciate those who preserve conservative and uh, conserve manual. Next, please. Yes, this is libraries is not yet fully integrated to the national data infrastructure. Yes, we. Uh, it is uh, to uh, to implement what the directive of the presidents that the national library is as part of the government. So we have to contribute 
to send our data to the National Data Center because this is an example of NLE, that's the National Library, and then we have two that actually in inlist and then one search. Inlist is the open, uh, the uh, what is it, the the uh, application for for what is it to to do the the library management that is the uh, based on the mark base and then online uh, one search that I will talk about it later on and also ipusnas it can be accessed all over Indonesia and other ministry will do the same thing next please yes this is knowledge discovery that is the we have the well, Indonesian one search and here is the Indonesian one search is single search portal for all public collection from libraries and at the moment we can collect uh, we can have the 12 million point six hundred and eight thousand records and then also the member is around eleven thousand uh, sorry it's more than uh, not eleven thousand actually this is for the direct repositories the repository itself is eleven thousand and this is connected uh, um, almost all the libraries in Indonesia. Not all, but mostly about more than 20% of the libraries in Indonesia is connected to us. And this is for the, uh, the system is for the anti-plagiarism tools, subject analysis tools, and OII, OPOPH, Open Archive, uh, Archive Initiatives. Uh, next. Yeah, this is the institution. I mentioned that this library institution is 300. Librarians, libraries is 4,000. Uh, 4, and then the repository institution is 11,000. It's a very big uh, knowledge can be reserved there. So we can, uh, more and more knowledge is coming. Then we also motivate those who are not yet become part of this program. Uh, they have to join us and we also give them a freedom to whether they want to uh, send it to the us, it's the apps, only the abstract or only the metadata or full text is up to their policy in uh, individuals, uh, institutions. And we have that, a lot, uh, what is it, the contributors, it's quite a lot, National Library of course, the biggest contributors and also there's a university, yeah, that's also contribute their collections to us. Next please. Yeah, this is the e-mobile. We have the e -pusnas that I mentioned earlier. Yes, this is, uh, we, uh, we have that social media based library provide digital books to read, share, and shop. This applica uh, application available on mobile, on mobile and then uh, using digital right management and technology as the security. And in this also, we have the menu is for e donations for those who write books and then want to donate their books and give the right to the National Library so you can and up, uh, up to now we all have around 140 books that is donated to the National Library and that is free then everybody can access it well, we can. For, it's, it doesn't have the the royalty things. No, we are not talking about the royalty things because we can give uh, what's it voluntarily, and it's free. Okay, next. And this is another one. This is the our latest is Bintang Purpose Edu. This is for the educations, and we work quite uh, 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 close to the Minister of uh, Educations and also Minister of Religion. Why Minister of Religion? Because Minister of Religion, they also have schools that we can uh, collaborate it. And this platform provides to improve access to the digital content for schools and university. The contents are varied, such as audio books, video books, educational tutorials, scientific journal, all of this can be accessed via multiple platform. The total collections that we have in here is for elementary schools, a total collection uh, for the elementary schools is 26,000 something, and then junior high school is 22,000 something, and senior high school is 50,000, and then university is 262,000 something, and the book, uh, I, I was it digital books from the Ministry of Religion, uh, we have, uh, 58,000, and from the Ministry of Education, we have 1,063,000 uh, 
thousand books that is stored there, so it can be accessible for the community. Think next, yeah. Next. Oh, this is a sorry. Yeah, this is for the e-resources. E-resources is the service that we have. This is digital collection for the Service National Library Indonesia, which are either subscribed or made independently by the, the National Library. It means that we subscribe the book that I think everybody is familiar in here. And there is one, is, there is nility that's mainly for the research for the manuscript. And also there's a book, uh, Balai Pustaka, that is we digitize their book and then they, we put it here. And this is, uh, free and to be able to access this you have to be the member of the national libraries and you can do it online to become the national library members and the national library uh, memberships with the uh, what's the, the the membership number we now connect it to the our national ID and that's it integrated thank you that's all I think Thank you so much, Woro, for sharing this case, too. Uh, yeah, I can also think it is indeed an interesting example of, of a case that can be followed by other libraries, but not just in terms of digital empowerment, but also in terms of economic growth that is tied to, to, to the use of libraries. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And now uh, we're going to move on to the next case, uh, which is the case from Trish Hepworth, who is the Director on Policy and Education for the Australian Library and Information Association. And she works across the sector to empower the workforce and also strengthen libraries to achieve a socially just and progressive society. Thank you, Maria. So, and I wish I was there, but thank you very much for having me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge today that I'm coming from the lands of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, Maria, are my slides up? Oh, thank you. Perfect. Brilliant. Um, I, I guess I wanted just to very quickly have a little bit of a look at, at what this looks like from Australia. So in Australia, we have a, an index called the Digital Inclusion Index that gives us um, statistics about digital inclusion across the whole population. And the Digital Inclusion Act, um, Index measures the accessibility, the affordability, and the ability of people online, and then basically gives a score. What you can see up there is some of the, the various vectors that we know are wildly different across the country. So Australia is a very concentrated metropolitan kind of a country. We've got a, most of our population lives in cities along the coast. And there is a huge difference between the digital inclusion scores in metropolitan areas, which are quite high, and the digital inclusion scores in regional and remote Australia, which are much lower. Similarly, for our First Nations people, so our, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia, we can see that they have a much lower digital inclusion index than um, the Australian population generally. But again, in particular, at the further you go from those metropolitan areas, the lower the digital inclusion index. Now, the next slide, please, Maria. And across all of the different uh, vectors, we see a really significant change across age grants. So this um, graph at, on your screen at the moment talks about digital exclusion. So it's looking at those two bits around accessibility and affordability. And as you can see for younger age groups, the ability to um, access digital worlds to be online is much higher and as you go through the older age groups, that accessibility really drops. And if I could have the next slide, Maria. Um, and that probably unsurprisingly goes with ability as well. So, and we see this across all of the things, the accessibility and the ability of people are closely correlated. So people with the most access also have the most ability and comfort online. Those with the least access, so First Nations people, regional people, older people, they have the least ability online. If I could have the next slide. To have a look at what that actually looks like in practice, 
only 23% of Australians were confident that they could edit a video and post it online. So the fundamental ability to be on TikTok, for example, is only shared by a quarter of people in Australia. Only 35%, so just over a third, were confident that they could work out if they were being harassed online and if they were being harassed, what they could do with it or which authorities they could report it to. And if I could have the next slide. It, while people's abilities and media literacy is quite low, people's interest in being secure and able digital citizens is very high. So when you ask people, they are really keen to know how they can protect themselves from scams. They want to use media across all the different forms of media to stay connected with community, to stay connected with friends and family. And if we have a look at the next slide, this is very much where libraries come in. So uh, across the library systems, and in particular libraries in educational institutions, so schools and TAFEs, which is our vocational education in Australia, and universities and public libraries, we see that librarians are already working solidly in these areas. So you have the infrastructure from libraries to um, have the the access to the internet, as, as Waro and Erica said, the uh, ability to access community-based connections, but also nationwide digital collections. So you have those accessibility ports, but we also see with libraries is a huge role in bolstering that ability as well. So when you ask libraries, they are helping people find resources in the catalogue and they're helping people find information online, but they're also providing a basic support about how to use computers or about how to use mobile phones, how to stay safe online. And if we could have the next slide, I just wanted to do a very quick look at a little local library, um, Hume Libraries, which is based down on NAM, so on Wiradjuri country in Melbourne. So Hume Libraries is a very, is situated in a highly multicultural area. And so they um, can see that all of those cross uh, the correlation. So they've got communities who have English as a second language, which is a often one that looks at digital exclusion. They have older communities who often have English as a second language and they have outer, outer metropolitan. So that's another one where you will find people of lower digital literacy. If I could have the next slide. So Hume Libraries have run a huge amount of work in conjunction with the local university to actually run out a research project around how do we deliver digital literacy programs for culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And the thing about using the libraries is that the infrastructure was already there. So they were able to pull together the resources they had around community engagement. Um, they were able to harness the people in the libraries and also the community community relations that were already there and they had a system in place for the programs. So working with these three together, they very successfully managed to tailor digital inclusion programs for called communities or culturally and linguistically diverse communities that went across age ranges and abilities. So that looks different for different people. You might have um, people who are absolutely fluent in spoken English but unable to do written English or perhaps need their content in video or audio format. You might have people have different accessibility issues. You need to be able to find case studies and um, ways of working with people that relate to collections that are important to them and communities in which they are already participating. So running these sort of programs in your local library means that you can have a very tailored uh, experience where you leverage the ability to have those central points for access, but also then brings in all of the support from the libraries to upskill that ability piece. If I could have the very last slide. 
I think some of the takeaways that we would say from Australia's experience is that it's not easy. Um, libraries are there, the public libraries are in every different community across Australia. So we go regional and remote, we have linguistically diverse, we have the older people going in. There's, there is no other organisation that is currently in a better position to be able to have the people already in coming in the door with the access. But having said that, every single community is different. So one of the things that the um, culturally and mystically diverse guidelines, for example, uh, developed was a list a toolkit for each library to then be able to work with local partners to build its own localised program. And the outcome of the program was that we had a group of people who went from being quite digitally nervous to being digitally confident. And that meant that they were more confident digital citizens, but they were also more confident citizens and better able to partake in Australian society and part of democratic society. So it was a resounding success as one case study. It's uh, replicated across the country and I hope that was of some interest to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, so much also for sharing the case of Australia. And also, I, I guess it's really interesting also to see how uh, a country as culturally diverse and linguistically diverse as Australia also, uh, could, this could be seen as a challenge, but uh, libraries are, seem to be addressing this in a very successful way, despite all the, all the diversity there. So, so thank you so much for sharing this case. Uh, so as we're running a bit out of time, I will move on to our next and last presenter, who is Yasuyo Inoue. And she will give us a local perspective on this topic. Uh, Yasuyo is a professor on public librarianship at the Tokyo University. And she has been a professor on other universities for more than 35 years, where she has been focusing mainly on children's and young adult library service. And also in the past, she was also a member of the Intellectual Freedom at the Library Committee of the Japan Library Association. Uh, please go ahead, Yasuyo. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, the time is not enough, and I didn't bring so many slides. So I just wanted to say that some uh, general information uh, based on in Japan. But uh, right now, the, from elementary school to junior high and the senior high, most of the kids have their own tablet or PC. So as for the technical things that they know how to use the computers, but the problem is that the lack of content. That's why the library needs some roles to uh, uh, provide information to, to the kid. And maybe 50 years later, most of the Japanese people can use any kind of the computers, but it's right on. So right now, the, what the library should do, um, I think library can do that with using ICT uh, uh, techniques. Uh, the library can connect to a rural area and urban area. There's the unfair situation right now, but they can connect uh, to these unfair situations or uh, maybe different strong direct area we can connect to each other through the materials and information at the libraries. Uh, overall, the library has a, uh, three roles. One is, as the other speakers mentioned, that uh, kind of a community activity center, as Eric said, uh, preserve their own culture or traditions. And the, another one is kind of educational or running center or information center. So um, not only books, but also a lot of data. So in that sense, library is a kind of a data center. So we concentrated and stocked a lot lot of big data, and now the many uh, public libraries in Japan, especially prefecture library, big libraries, they want to digitalize those uh, traditional historical materials into digitalized uh, materials and the provides to the users, especially National Diet Library, that National Central Library in Japan, 
they have the so huge big data. So they change their national diet library role and change the copyright role. Now they provide the data via internet. So the content provides to the each users. So more uh, uh, libraries um, can provide more data um, not only big national diet library level, but also local public library make the community get together. Like a slide right now, it's a very small town library, uh, Shiwa Library, uh, close to the Morioka city. I don't know why New York Times said that Morioka uh, foreigners should visit, I don't know, but the, this is a small town library, but the center, uh, central, uh, a photo that is a Japanese sake they just exhibit inside the library and they show that how they uh, make it brew the sake and sometimes they uh, tell uh, the people how to brew and what is the taste and what is the character of the sake. So they wanted to show that their local uh, business to the, the people at the library and the uh, the right side that is um, the library connect to the agriculture corporation so once a uh, once a week uh, there was a kind of the vegetable market in front of the library so people buy the vegetable and they come to into the library and there is a collection of the recipe so which Vegetable did you buy? You can use this recipe at your own home. So the agriculture business and the library connected to Kinley and the, uh, on the wall where the uh, farmers grown up the vegetables in that local area. So the library uh, stimulate the local business. So I think that is another community activity center law that our library played it. So not only uh, the real things, but also maybe in the future, more small town libraries will provide the digital materials. So if you have any trouble or questions, go to the local library, so maybe they will help you how to expand your local business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasuyo, and also all of you who, who are here today. And yeah, I think, well, as a final remark, I can only say that if we see all these cases that you presented, you can also see how the, the role of libraries, uh, well, you can see this common factor in all the cases about how uh, the role of libraries really is evolving uh, and yeah, with time and also with the use of internet and access and all that the communities can get uh, out of it at a local level. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing it. Uh, so now we still have a couple minutes left. Uh, so I would like to open the floor for the people who are here to ask any questions to the speakers. I don't know if we have any questions online. No? Okay. I thank you. I did have a question for Trish Hepworth, but is she still online? She is. I am. Oh, you are. <laughs> Great. Good to see you. Uh, Trish, uh, we had some contacts within IFLA in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And one of the contacts we had was that you made a presentation at, at a library um, webinar that I organized for the uh, in the framework of the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum and that was when was that two years ago I forget precisely um, but I wanted to ask you was there any um, body at the Brisbane meeting in August this year the Brisbane meeting of the Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum was there anybody there who was talking about the contribution of libraries because it seems to me that the your your comments about the digital inclusion index are highly relevant to all countries in fact you've got a model there which we should all 
probably imitate, that is countries which haven't got one should have one, have that sort of uh, system and monitor it and develop it. But was there anybody at Brisbane who uh, was talking about library information services, whether on the coast, as you said, in the metropolitan areas or in the outback, in remote areas? Do you know? We uh, Thanks, Winston, for the questions. Uh, we didn't have a, an ALI or a library representative as such, but we definitely had people who were at that forum talking to things like the Digital Inclusion Index and also to the, um, to the role of other sort of bodies such as libraries. And I think it's, you know, one thing I know is very top of mind for our policy makers in Australia at the moment is the increasing need around things like media literacy and digital skills with the rise of generative AI. And that's certainly something that we know is getting a lot of attention in sort of big structural things. So, you know, there's both the doom and gloom. Oh no, how will people be able to detect AI scams or what does this mean for the future of internet search? But also those huge potentials. So when you're, you know, working with people who might have lower levels of written literacy, the ability to use generative AI to help um, support them with job applications or even in writing search and prompts is, is huge. And so certainly from a policy perspective at the moment, I think there's a really important role for libraries to play in that digital skills and that AI media literacy space, which realistically... If you don't have libraries doing that work in a country like Australia, there isn't anybody else where adults who are not in formal education really have to go. Thank you, Trish. So do we have any other questions from the floor? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I am Johanna uh, Munyao. Uh, I'm a member of County Assembly uh, from Kenya. I want to appreciate uh, the presenters for packaging the information in the right way, uh, very clear. Uh, and also, I want to appreciate the approach of uh, taking knowledge closer to our rule of flock. I, uh, my, as I do appreciate that, I've realized that uh, this approach helps our, uh, our young ones to come together, socialize, share uh, uh, knowledge, uh, maybe also get exposed, and uh, uh, my 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 question is whether there is sensitization on how we have realized that in uh, the area of academia the most uh, tricky part is how to publish some of these uh, uh, works or maybe uh, some of the activities so that others from elsewhere can be able to access the same information access our experiences. Uh, do we really ever conduct feasibility studies to uh, either vet on the content and also see the compliance of the same uh, in terms of uh, uh, legal frameworks which may govern whatever you publish to be accessed through the internet? Uh, and again, I come from a rural uh, area where the poverty levels are a threat, very low. So you would uh, uh, realize uh, it is like uh, uh, where the government is not able to come in and support fully, coming up with such structures, however good they are, and I really appreciate, becomes a challenge. Personally, I am running an institution with a very tiny library. And the approach I've gotten from here 
has really enlightened me such that uh, I have thought of uh, only addressing the needs of uh, the learners within that small institution. But I have seen other learners can come together from even other institutions and uh, with such an access of such facility, uh, be able to share knowledge and even be able to take it to a higher level of publishing the same in the internet and sharing the experiences with the world over. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're, I think maybe we have time for one last question. No? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, we're at the end of our session anyways, but thank you so much uh, for all of, to all the speakers who are here today and who presented, and thank you so much for sharing your cases and your stories with us, and also thank you for the attendees and, and the questions, uh, really. I, we, we really appreciate your presence, and also if you would like to collaborate with us in the future, or if you have any ideas for, for opportunities or collaboration with libraries, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Thank you.